starting the recording right now. Well, hi, everyone. I'm Rick Zanotti, and next to me is Kirsten Rourke. Welcome to Immediate Chat. Hi, everybody. We're either episode 9 or 10. It's one of those. I never keep oh, track of the number. Yeah. So how are you doing today, Kirsten? Pretty good. Pretty good. How are you? I am really good. You have a good Thanksgiving? It was amazing. Amazing, it was amazing. is good. It was very good. <clears throat> it's good. Yeah, I've been working out a lot more after that. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of turkey. That's right. <clears throat> Uh, but we're not talking about family members now. We're just talking about food. But yeah. anyway. <laughs> hey, Kirsten, we have a cool guest today. Yeah, I'm really excited. This is, this is very good. Would you like to introduce him? So Kevin Brooks is a storyteller and a technology specialist and someone who has some very interesting titles and very interesting degrees. Um, not only a film degree from Stanford, but a, I'm going to get this wrong, interactive media is that right, Kevin? Uh, close enough. Uh, what is it from MIT? Yeah, Doctor. It's, uh, technically, it's media arts and sciences, which is a good description of uh, something very vague. So, <laughs> I thought it was like uh, interactive but, film was the section or something. Yeah, it was a interactive cinema was the section. That's it. That's yeah. it. And that, that's why I was like, yes, we have to have you on here because that's so cool. <laughs> and Kevin, welcome. Thank you. Well, you do some really neat stuff. <clears throat> We've been talking a little bit about it. You're an industrial designer, and I think you're just you start you're starting a new job. Imminently, you're moving. Uh, I am, um, and I'm doing those two things not at the same time, which is also <laughs> going to be interesting. So uh, I start a new job on Monday, and I move um, about uh, five weeks after Monday. Uh, so it'll be it'll be an interesting sort of uh, uh, you know distance distance work uh, kind of a deal. But uh, uh, yes, I'm going to be a senior industrial designer for Hallmark, um, where I'll be helping them design some new approaches to telling stories um, using new, new technology. That's great. You know, it's interesting. Recently, we had on Larry Jordan, who's very well known in the in the video world. He does a lot of Final Cut Pro training. Mm -hmm. And and he talks a lot about storytelling. Like we should have had both of you on at the same time. You guys would have had a blast. But he keeps saying, if when you make a film, it's all about story. Right. Nothing else really matters. It's, you know, special effects don't matter. It's really the story. Yeah, have you noticed that in, in filmmaking in today's day and age, the emphasis is on tech and not so much on story? Well, yeah, I, th I think it's because the, the, the film industry can very easily see the incremental advancement that technology provides, either in, um, you know, resolution or, or in... in computer graphics there you know it's it's easy to reach out and touch it's also um quantitative so you can sort of right. plot it <laughs> and predict it yep. uh, but you you can't do that with story that's hard it's a lot harder well you have to have a good storyteller all right all right that's, that's true so what would you what would you define as a good storyteller well um i like to think of different mediums so different people tell stories um, uh, differently in different mediums. You know, I was, I went to film school and was learning how to tell stories with computers when I discovered oral storytelling and it kind of reset me. And uh, I had to start from the very beginning of learning how to tell stories in the original form and changed my metrics and changed my, the way that I understood story. And so, and it, and it allowed me to see, you know, okay, filmmakers um, will, 
tell stories in a certain way, and some of them are really good, and some of them are not so much, um, in part because they might get confused between the mediums. You know, um, we all can list movies that have come over from books. So there was a, it was a popular book, it gets made into a movie, and we go, oh, that was not very good. <laughs> um, and... <laughs> then the, the, the translation doesn't work. The, the story that is so good in literary forms does not, in a literary form, does not make a good uh, movie, might not make a good play, and would make a horrible oral story presentation. So you have to really think about how the medium works and, and what your audience is expecting and where your audience is head is at, you know, for each different medium, which makes... Um, storytelling with computers so interesting because your audience can be in so many different places mm -hmm. uh, and looking at or watching reading your story uh, with so many different devices and so many different contexts now you said something i find really interesting when you were talking about the oral tradition so was that literally telling a story from one person to another Absolutely. Okay. Um, I was in a, a doctoral program at MIT, and I was, uh, in, in fact, the, the, the full story is that uh, I came to MIT in part to become more creative, um, which a lot of people would not have ordinarily <laughs> you know, thought that that was possible. But, you know, there are enormous num uh, number of creative people and programs at MIT. And I was writing short stories where I was trying to write short stories. I had a writing partner, um, and we were passing these stories back and forth, and I was working hard on these short stories. And they were horrible. They were just <laughs> horrible. I, I didn't want to read them after I wrote them. Um, and <laughs> I didn't know why, you know, and, you know, why, why are my stories so bad? At least I had the presence of mind to know that my writing was bad. Um, and I heard, I started hearing on the radio um, ads for storytellers, either storytelling performances or storytelling conference that uh, happened in the spring every year, still happens in the spring. Then it was happening in downtown Boston. And I was intrigued. And I asked my advisor if she would spring for me to go to the storytelling conference, which when you compare it to any of the scientific conferences, you know, an arts conference was like a drop in the bucket. You know, they, this was affordable. Sending me to, you know, California to, you know, um, an AI conference, way more expensive than this. So, yeah, take the, take the subway downtown to a arts conference. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'll pay for that. Uh, so I went and I was amazed. You know, I was just amazed at what I saw um, and what I heard. There were people with the power to hold me and hold a room full of people in their hand <laughs> for a long time um, and to make me see these images much more vividly than I would in the movies. I could hear it. I could feel it. My heart would race. Uh, I heard this woman uh, by the name of Fran Yardley um, tell a 15, 20-minute story about her own birth from the perspective of her mother. So it's her mother's story about her birth. And that was astounding. You know, just that, that change in perspective was just so intriguing and so new to me. Right? Uh, and at the time, I only had one story. I had one of my short stories, which I knew was potentially good or parts were good, but um, you know, I didn't know how to end it. And it was a story about my freshman year of college. And my freshman year of college was at an engineering school. And uh, for the first for that year, I had two different roommates, and they were both bigots. And so... <laughs> Fun. Yes, it was a funny, funny story about my, about my freshman year with two bigots. Um, <laughs> and I, uh, you got to tell us that story one day. That sounds like a good one. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, at the storytelling conference, they have these things called story swaps, where this is happening in one a small little college in downtown Boston. 
Um, and so in this classroom, you know, late at night, there may be 20 people sitting around in like a circle. And one person stands up and tells a story for 10 minutes. Another person stands up, tells a story for 10 minutes. And this happens for two, two and a half hours. It's amazing. The variety is all over the place. And this is after I heard Fran tell this the story of her own birth, birth. And right before the session was over, I raised my hand and said, okay, I have a story, you know, and I was so nervous. And I told this story about my freshman year. And when it was over, you know, people applauded politely and, you know, and, you know, we all stood up and, you know, we were ushered out of the classroom because they were closing it down. And Fran was at the door. And as I walk out, Fran said, turned to me and said, wait a minute, Kevin, I just have to hug you that story and at that moment I thought you know if I could tell a story and get strange women to hug me <laughs> <laughs> I have something here you know yes and, you know there, there and there's the ego trip of getting strange women to hug me but also clearly that story touched her in a way that that is more meaningful than it would have been if you know it was a movie <laughs> Um, wow. And so I've, I've been, I've gone on. I've, I kept going. I, there is a, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, for a long time, there was a, a guy by the name of Brother Blue, who was out in Harvard Square um, telling stories on the street. He's been out there since the 60s or the 70s. Um, and he had a weekly storytelling venue, and I started going there on Tuesday nights and would just listen for months <laughs> listened to all these stories for months. I eventually got up and told my own eight-minute story about my own name, which was no big deal. Um, um, but while I was up there in the middle of this eight-minute story about my name, looking out in this audience of, I don't know, 30 people, I realized why my short stories were so bad. They were so bad because while I was writing them, I had no idea who the audience was. Ah. I was just writing them. Okay. And when you're standing up and telling a story, there's no mistaking who the audience is. They are right there. there. They're right in front of you. And they're giving you back this energy uh, that a storyteller, if they're open to it, if they're smart, then they can surf that energy i call it surfing the audience um they're giving back energy the the storyteller can adjust their story um according to that energy how the audience moves you know what they react to how they react um you know the storyteller can know when they have the audience um and when they don't have the audience and when they have them then they can do anything with them they could take them anywhere in a lot of different ways but you have to be open knowing when you have them um <clears throat> and from then on i started using that storytelling practice i've been doing it now for 15 years and applying that practice to you know all of you know my other work to you know working in user experience um to working in technology design um to uh, coming up with new ideas for how we could use technology. You know, storytelling is, you know, one of the best tools for being creative. It uses both halves of your brain. Yeah, yeah uh, you're right. And it's interesting. If, if you look at our society, I think we're losing the ability to tell stories starting at the family level. Yeah. Because if you think about it, in the, in the old days, not that long ago, maybe 20, 30 years, a lot of generations tended to live either close or, or with each other. Right. And so grandfather, grandmother would tell you the stories of their life. Right. And yep. that they would put it into context, and then you'd have those stories, and you tell it to your kids. <clears throat> and as a result, you're, you're learning how to tell stories, and they had their own colorful way of telling stories. We're not seeing that that much anymore. And I think we're losing a really valuable thing because that's how our traditions are passed, whatever the tradition may be, or or how emotions can be passed, how just knowledge can be passed without even people realizing you're giving, you're imparting knowledge. You know, 10, 20 years later, you think about it and go, that's what they meant. Um, and it's interesting. That's something I find that, that we are losing, and it's probably a worldwide phenomenon. I think it's almost everywhere. Um, even in, for example, Indian cultures, like Native Americans, they don't do the storytelling like they used to. 
um, I've talked to some some people who are tribal leaders, and they said, "Yeah, we, the young kids don't want to hear it anymore," or or even they're having they're moving out of the reservations or whatever they're living in. So it's real interesting that that that's it's an early moment in our lives where we would get stories. We're not getting it now, right. and so it's so it's almost we have to relearn how to tell the story. Yeah, there. Uh, I think that our definition of what sophistication means uh, has gotten warped. You mm-hmm, know, mm-hmm. you know, listening to stories and telling stories, and using that relation, your relationship with someone or you know multiple people, and engage them in a story is a very complicated and very sophisticated mm-hmm. thing to. Do. Um, instead, we define you know Skype and we define television. Right. right. The techie, the techie part of it. Right. The messenger part of this. So well, actually, we're not even shooting the messenger. We're sh- it's the tech. Do you have the tubes to, to make it happen? Cool. What do you do with it? Um, so, you know, so hey, Kevin- hey, Kirsten, this is something, and, and yep. I kind of wanted to touch upon this because you're a designer too. I, have you noticed the phenomenon of people, and you guys are both designers, and you look at, when you look at a blank slate, you see things. Most yeah. people look at, for example, a PowerPoint screen and go, uh, what do I do? Yeah. They get terror because and they and they just, just see a white green things. or whatever background you've got, and they go, "What do I do?" That still happens to designers it, too, though. <laughs> it, it does, but not as much because you have more no. tools at your disposal. Well, I think it's knowing. I don't know. From for me, it seems like it's knowing that you can take risks and being willing, at some point, to make a fool of yourself in a certain way, <laughs> which I imagine ties really into the storytelling. Because standing up there for the first couple of times must have been heartbreakingly scary. But after a while, you know, well, if I go up and I fail, my world won't end. And it's kind of the same way with design. It's I can put out this, this design or this look or this, this way of perceiving things. And if people don't like it, it will feel bad, but it won't feel as bad as I think it will. Well, think about this, too. For example, the first time you told the story, Kevin, you said you were nervous. And then all of a sudden, you probably got an audience feedback. You got some sort of feedback, like a laugh. It could have been a sigh. It could have been whatever you were telling and, and, you know, you're smart. We start measuring, hey, that actually went over pretty well. And then you kind of go in that direction. And you can start gearing things to what the audience likes to hear, but also reinforces the story. And I, I think that's anybody who's been a public speaker really doesn't know what the heck they're doing until they get in front of that audience. And all of a sudden, they start learning very quickly what works yeah. and what doesn't. What you were talking about with surfing, essentially surfing the crowd, is is taking that energy and figuring out how to shape your message. Yeah. yeah. So is that what you're doing professionally now? Is is shaping messages? Uh, boy, that's a good question. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah. Put you on the spot. Well, I, I I think I, I ideally I create messages to shape. Okay. Um. Uh, in, you know, often, you know, as, as I said, the medium is the message, the, 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 the container, the, the, the container, the delivery mechanism is, you know, is part of the message. You know, when a storyteller stands up in front of someone, um, then they are part of the story, whether they like it or not. You know, when you see a movie and it says directed by Steven Spielberg, you know, you, you're set up for a kind of story and, and a certain expectation. You know, whether or not you recognize all the, the Spielberg-esque, you know, uh, fingerprints in the movie or not. Um, uh, so... So the package is also part of that message, and I guess I do shape that. I guess I sh- do shape the message in that case. You know, I'm <clears throat> what I'm sh- what I want to shape is an experience. I want okay. people to uh, to laugh, to cry, to think, to bring out the emotion, right? Yeah, yeah, and you know, when that happens, amazing things happen. I mean, you know, it's amazing to me, <laughs> this is my own, you know, private you know, pet peeve, not so private now, is that <laughs> when, when, we, when people walk through the front doors of their corporate office, they immediately divorce themselves from any connection they would naturally have to stories. Hmm. You know, they can think of, PowerPoint presentations, but not stories. Now they could have told their kids a story the night before. They could have told their spouse a story in the morning before getting in the car. But they walk through that door and they are turned off to stories. Now, 
that has a positive and negative side. Negative side is that they're tur- they've, they've turned off a large portion of their brain and their experience and uh, their humanity. They've turned off a part of their humanity. Um, what that also means, the positive side, is that when someone tells them a story in that context, it hits them from left field. Mm-hmm. They have no idea what's coming and they will they have natural protections of uh, being in a in a corporate environment you know they're less likely to cry they're less likely to react you know greatly but if you can get a good story in that that touches on their emotion and touches on their intelligence and and in- includes their intelligence and engages their own experience what they also believe is true when you tell a story about a house and they see their house <laughs> then that story becomes their story and they are and they have no idea where that truck came from so that could be a pretty powerful way of getting a point across selling coming up with a new technological idea, coming up with a whole list of patent, uh, uh, patent disclosures. Um, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a good tool. Yeah, it's interesting. We, we did a project for Southern California Edison. For their, it's really a team-building project for their OSHA group, Safety. And they wrote the story. They actually wrote a story that was actually about five minutes long, and it was about um, a, a lineman who is doing everything wrong. Mm-hmm. And the story starts with the lineman who kisses her grandkid and heads on off. She's always in a rush. She keeps looking at her watch. And then starts going in the field and starts making mistakes one by one by one. And at the end, we killed her. She made one terrible mistake and wound up getting electrocuted. And then we had a small get-together office-like funeral scene. And you realize they put this in front of about 150 adults they were they were bawling at the end. They yeah. were actually crying in in a corporate environment because it touched them because they had lost one about six months earlier, uh, and it okay. hit. So the training was actually very effective, mm-hmm. but it was really a story. It was nothing more than a story. There was no dialogue at all. It was a visual story of that person's life over that day, done yep. in about five minutes. It was fascinating. We had never really done anything like that, and we had never really killed anybody on screen for corporate <laughs> video. And it was actually very effective. And I was shocked when we heard the response that they actually were bawling. Grown people who've been there 20, 30 years were bawling watching this. That's so, so sounds like you, when I you got, got your job done. We got our job done. Well, they got their job done. They wrote it. Yeah. We just we were the techies who made it happen. We were the filmmakers. But it was just really wonderful seeing that kind of power out of something that seemed... Sam, we were having fun filming with a lot of jokes and everything, and yet the final result worked. Yep. Wow. And that's like you said, the power of storytelling at its best. Yeah. Now, the, the, the other side of that is that once you tell a story that is that effective, you need to, ahead of time, prepare for the, the, the fallout or... Mm-hmm. <clears throat> So, you know, because people who, especially in a corporate environment, people, when people react emotionally, they are not going to necessarily react predictably. (laughs) That's because it's so out of character. So, um, you may want to move now. I I don't know what they did to, 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 at the end of it. We, we didn't see the whole thing. And, um, so I'm not sure. I wonder what they did do, but supposedly safety went really up. They were, they had like a non- uh, safety injuries in that group went down to nothing. Right. Um, and I got, these were seasoned vets, most of them, probably most of them 40s, 50s. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure what they did afterwards to kind of help decompress them and see what kind of results they were getting out of that. Um, very fascinating. So, Kevin, how do you do that in in a corporate environment? How do you make the space safe enough so that you can bring in stories in all these different mediums and, you know, have some room for people to have the reactions they're going to react. Is that just setting the stage in advance and telling people, you know, this room is private? Or is there some, is there some way to do that? Or do you just hope? Well, you, uh, well, you could set the, the, if it, well, every, every space is different, right? Every, every company is different. Every corporate, corporate culture is different. So I could see you saying that this is a safe space, but you know what? No, 
space is a safe space. So, you know, why? Why? Well, you can okay. announce. But Fair enough. That's not really going to work. Um, wait, hold on for a second. My power cord came out. Um, uh, however, you can uh, imply safety just through the tone of your voice. All right. um, I would not announce, um, okay, now I'm going to tell you a story, or here's a story. Because in a corporate se setting, some people might immediately shut off because of that. Right. So okay, that makes sense. While while you are <clears throat> introducing it, go right into the story. You do not, you know, it doesn't need any preference at all. You do not need to justify storytelling. Um, uh, you Be because it is natural. It's a natural kind of thing that happens. I mean, how many times do you stand by a water cooler and somebody walks by and you tell them a story? Right. Yeah, and they don't start with "Once Upon a Time." So right. you know. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You don't say hi. I'm going to tell you a story now. Right. Right. And and the, I think the, the point is, depending on the the corporate context or the, the the business context, the the key is images. This is also true for um, uh, for for um, audio conferences for for phone conferences. Um, you want to use short imagery that people can imagine. Uh, you want to describe it, and so that people can imagine it immediately, and they do not need to imagine it accurately. Right? Accuracy is not important. Um, uh, sort of depth of intake is important. So you you know use the five senses. What is something uh, not just and and not just what does something look like, but what does it sound like? What does it smell like? You know what is it taste like you know what does it feel like what are those by by using your other senses you can immediately communicate an image that can be quite short so you could tell a story that's you know 30 seconds long um and will stay with someone all day much longer than their one hour meeting they may have just come from and and how did your work at mit tie into this you know, it, it tied in in a, in a number of ways. One, so my work at MIT was around creating a software tool to allow people to write stories that can change shape. So it was an it was an artist's tool. You know, under the 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 idea that if you give someone Microsoft Word, then they'll write something quite linear. Um, um, and if you give someone a hammer, then everything looks like it. Right. Um, yeah want to write a story that changes shape if you want to write a story that's interactive you need a writing tool that is that allows you to describe the story that um, has different shapes and so that's what my my research was uh, uh, to, to create this and so mainly I was looking at stories that had uh, multiple first person perspectives so jumping from one perspective to another and so the writing is about you know different people seeing the same thing or slightly different things so that's one way that that it helped thinking about uh, uh, just thinking about story in general but also at MIT that the lab that I was in is corporately funded and so to keep the corporate funding happening you know the media lab does an enormous number of demos and uh back then there were you no know, now there are consortia groups of sponsors um that sort of band together and fund around a certain you know sort of larger research area and so there are consortia meetings where a lot of sponsors come and a lot of students show what they're doing and and so it's very organized um what happens twice a year but back when i was a student there were fewer consortia so there were sponsors in there every day or it seems that way multiple times so we were doing demos it was like working in a fishbowl and we were doing demos you know maybe five times a week six seven times a week sponsors can show up you know as a surprise and we had to be able to jump in and do a demo and for me i took that as an opportunity so um i might be doing a demo to european bankers um, um one minute to some you know hollywood types the next minute to some technologists from some large silicon valley company to you know someone else to someone else to someone else and it may be the business people or marketing people that just want to come through and smell the air of the lab or it might be 
Jones, you know, who <clears throat> want to, uh, you know, pull some code and throw in a product. Um, it could be, you know, anyone from any of these companies. You know, we never knew. So, so I found that the best thing to do is to figure out who I was speaking with, find out who my audience is and who audience was, and then gear my same story to whoever my audience is. And if possible, figure out their preconceived notions, one about the media lab and two about technology. Um, I had one company come through, actually it was a, it was a European banker who came through and uh, what a lot of people do is they will start bragging about their high technology stuff, right? And one, uh, because they're at MIT, so, you know, they, they want to brag too. And so one company was bragging about how they're producing CDs now, CD-ROMs now. Like, okay, good for you. CD Rob. <laughs> you know, had to go with that and say, and now gear a lot of my story around their understanding of what high technology is. They're producing CD ROMs in the banking industry, you know, or they're producing, you know, something else or telling a Hollywood movie or 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 people who come through that that you know do, you know, low level algorithms. You know, they you know, it's not that every audience Every audience is a win. You know, I don't. I know I didn't win over every audience, but every audience is different. It's a different opportunity, so it helped hone my story. And a lot of audiences do not speak English as a first language, and so some audiences were there with a with a translator. So that's when you particularly have to look at um, what does something smell like, what does something feel like, uh, because those translate really really well we all have feelings we all have a sense of smell right and if we only describe looks then we're we're taking a lot of the natural you know beauty of a story potential of a story out but you know when a translator you know translates into japanese that that this has a, that something has a certain texture you know they get that they might not get the high food new technological word that you came up with to describe your your process but they get how something feels they get how they get how something um might smell and that might not be your technology but it might be the effect that your technology has on people so that's how you know mit helped me i i have since tried to teach i've since taught storytelling at mit to grad students so that they can you know, tell some better stories for sponsors. And, you know, hopefully I, <laughs> I had some uh, good effect, you know, because they have great story material, right? They have great, great stuff, amazing stuff. Let's, you know, make it sound amazing and not, so I have this algorithm and this is what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you recommend any tools, any software tools? I know there's things like Dramatica and some other software packages that let you create story outlines and maybe even develop the stories and characters and everything else for somebody who's trying to learn how to be creative or learn how to tell a story or write a story what, what would you recommend best thing to do i mean and this is always the best thing and and i uh get it getting sometimes getting people at mit to do this is a little bit like pulling teeth but um the best way to learn storytelling is to go listen to storytellers <laughs> and to just listen. And there are enough venues in all over the place to do that. Um, you know, in California and certainly in the Boston area and around every major city, there are regular storytelling gatherings and there are storytelling festivals and there are storytelling conferences, you know, where it might be five people, it might be 30 people, it might be 300 people, or it might be the National Storytelling Festival mm -hmm. in Jonesboro, Tennessee with 10,000 people. Wow. You know, you just go listen yeah and the more you listen the more you kind of get the way they do it and and we emulate and you and you see okay i didn't like that or i did like this mm -hmm. i did like that i did like this or for me there's a there's a storyteller by the name of jay o'callahan that lives in the uh, uh, south of boston 
and um, very famous, world famous. And the first time I heard him live, um, it was in an auditorium. It was a long time ago. It was in an auditorium with maybe 200 people in it, most of whom I didn't know. And I was just sitting there in the dark auditorium. And he, he was just alone on this big auditorium stage, and he started telling a story. And I was aware of the story for the first five minutes. I was aware of me sitting in the audience listening to him tell the story for the first five minutes of the story. And I was probably aware of me sitting in the audience um, listening to him tell the story for the last five minutes of the story. For everything in between, I was not aware of me sitting in that audience. Hmm. I later found out that the story that he told was an hour and 15 minutes long. Right. So there was an hour of five, hour and five minutes where he took me to a steel town in Pennsylvania and took me into the head of all these characters, and I was there. Right. So that experience, I remember. Right? I, I remember the story. I remember what that's like, and I remember some of the things that he did in the middle of the story that just, just. I was just so amazed at what he could do and how he held the audience. And so I think about that when I tell. I think about all the little things that, that I've heard other storytellers, seen other storytellers do. And I'll I'll pull that out anytime. You know, just like if you want to be a good, you know, filmmaker, go watch the movies. <laughs> you know? That's true. Yep. Yep. I got a question from the chat pod, which sure. is um are you telling stories around Boston? And I wrote in that sadly we're losing you. Um, so what would you recommend people go if they want to, you know, where's the first few places they should look? They want to um, see storytelling. In, in the Boston area. In the Boston there, area. There's an organization called Lanes, L-A-N-E-S dot org. Um, that's the League for the Advancement of New England Storytelling. And so there is a national there, I'm sorry, there's a regional conference that happens every spring. Um, uh, there is also a group that has been meeting for 20 years um, every week in Cambridge. Um, it's called Story Space, um, and they meet in Central Square in Cambridge, and you can find them at storyspace.org. Um, also, there is an organization called Mass Mount that has um, that's starting to branch out and get more f- types of storytelling formats but they've been they're really known for doing story slams um, five minute um, experiential um, stories and uh, they have a season of stories that sort of uh, patterned after the moth um, and uh, their season runs from about September through um, April or May um, and and so that's massmouth.org um, and you can easily become a member of that and so those are the places where it's happening every week there is uh, you know you know one or two storytelling events in the Boston area and um also from lanes, you can find organizations in all over New England. So New Hampshire, Maine, Connecticut, Rhode Island, uh, lots of storytellers all over the place. Um, and uh, there are also the, the national organization at uh, storynet.org, um, where you can uh, find out you know, what things are happening on a national basis. So, and, and my... I've been doing this for about 15 years, and it's based on work that I was doing earlier in film and in uh, you know multimedia, and so I relate oral storytelling to all of that other work. Um, I see how it connects. I see how it enlivens. Um, um, also with writing, so uh, I think that oral storytelling and that practice at least listening to it is a great way to become a better writer um, a better thinker about interactive stories um, uh, and also frankly a, a better engineer uh, since uh, you know, I, I used to teach this, uh, this uh, workshop at MIT every January called uh, Storytelling for Money uh, because 
every story that a grad student or an undergrad is going to tell while at MIT is going to be for money. It's money is going to be associated with somehow. It's going to be to an advisor for their their research topic, to a venture capitalist, to a you know interview uh, a job interview or or something. You know there there's you can find you know, connection to money, and and so engineers need to know how to tell their own story. You know better. Scientists need to n- know how to tell their story better and know who their audience is. And that's a tough one for engineers. Yep. Yep. So, In fact, Kevin, um, your book. Yeah. So before be- before we lose you, I want to make sure we you mention we mention your book. So yep. So in two thousand ten. I co-wrote a book with Whitney Quisenberry called uh, Storytelling for User Experience. And it's a book that, uh, that teaches you how to tell stories or, or shows you how storytelling fits in the uh, user experience design and in design in general, in, into the design practice. Um, and it's, a, it's published on, uh, by Rosenfeld Media, and all of Rosenfeld Media's books are you know, very practical. So it's a, a practical use of, a practical application of uh, a, a technique um, within user experience and design and you know, information. So, <clears throat> so that's what it is, and, and it's been selling well. And the, the last part, the, the, it, the book, well, it, it's not, we, we don't have this specifically in the book. The book is basically split up into, uh, into three parts. Um, uh, the first part is why storytelling, or what is storytelling, um, and why storytelling. And the second middle part is how storytelling fits into user experience design, into what the different parts of user experience. Um, and the third part is how you construct a story. What are the elements of a story that you can use? What are structures um, and, and, and things like that? How really create it um, and uh, so it's, it's, it's very practical on that point and we also have a set of storytelling cards that you can get that can uh, help you come up with a story when you need one that's great wow. is it also available on Kindle or Nook it is it right. is available on Kindle um, you can if you go to rosenfeldmedia.com um, you when you buy the book you get both you can buy both a paper version and an ebook version. Great. Um, if from the chat room, will you come back to do another IAP? Um, I don't know. Um, I'd like to. Um, uh, it doesn't even have to be IAP. It's the the uh, the January workshop that uh, that I've done, and I would love to. Or it doesn't have to be an IAP. So whenever I'm back. So maybe when I'm back for. Uh, sharing the fire um, in early April. If someone lets me know, uh, um, I can do a storytelling workshop then. Sounds good. And Kirsten, we are just about out of time. Kevin, when we'd love to have you come back, and maybe even after you've been at Hallmark for a while, tell us some of the experiences. And I mean, everybody knows Hallmark. And it'd be pretty cool to find out uh, what some of the processes are, how you guys come up with some of the ideas and stuff. I think that'd be really neat for for the for the audience, and I know personally I'd find it really interesting. I think Kirsten probably would too. Definitely. Okay. Sure. Thank you. That'd be fun. Well, have a have a great move and enjoy the uh, the different air. It'll, it'll <laughs> definitely be different air over there. And no, but at, at least at least we'll have mobile fiber, you know. So yeah, yeah that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Kevin, a real pleasure, and we wish you luck and and safety in your move. Yes, and, and, safe travels. And Kirsten, we'll see you next week. Yep, definitely. So we will be back on immediate chat. Thanks for being there. If you're in the chat room, thanks so much for being there. And if you're watching the recording, please subscribe. It'll be up a little bit later today. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye.